Oh, Paul, it's your mum here. How are you getting on? These days, the telephone is the only contact Teresa Gallagher has with her son, Paul. Uh, just everybody's keeping fine here. Everybody's asking for you. Everybody must sit. Uh, would you like to come home? Teresa okay. lives in Northern Ireland's second city. As a Catholic, she knows it as Derry. OK, then. All the best. Look after yourself. Her son's been run out of town by the IRA. He's exiled in Liverpool. His mother wants him home. His offences? Petty crime in an area where the effective police force is still often the IRA rather than the RUC, and a suspicion that he was a tout, an informer. The IRA told me to get out, you know, while I get my knees blown off. And they pulled me in, you know, and they questioned me. They pulled me in this house, you know, with all masks and all the guns and all, for about 12 hours, you know, and... I recognised their voices, you know, and they knew uh, I knew them, you know, and they told me uh, uh, not to tell anyone who they were, you know, but I went out and I told them mate after they let me go, and that's why they told me to go out. According to Sinn Féin, there are up to 100 cases like Paul's in this city at any one time. Youngsters accused of burglaries and assaults who have fallen foul of the IRA's style of justice. Paul and many like him, with nowhere to hide in their native city, owe their lives to the members of a remarkable group. Men like Jimmy Duffy, who go to the IRA to negotiate safe passage and safe houses for them out of town. The city's peace and reconciliation group, whose story has never been told before, operates from rented premises close to the city centre. We don't have a normal society in Northern Ireland, I regret to say, so these problems do arise out of the conflict, unfortunately. Uh, well, perhaps she gives them touch, and if there's anything we can do to help them. Oh, exactly. Made up of 14 Republicans, loyalists and others, the group commits itself not to declarations of peace, but to action on the ground. Among its other tasks, it negotiates with paramilitaries to stop people under threat like Paul getting hurt. Paul's mother knows what she owes the group. Well, I wouldn't. I don't know what I ever would have done without Jimmy that day. No, they're very, very good, and there's always going to be somebody else going to need, need his help, you know. If they hadn't had Jimmy that day, I had nobody, I had nobody to help me. He was the only one I had. If he had to turn me down, I don't know what, what else he would have done. Are you feeling all right? Uh -huh. The group's chairman, Margaret O'Donnell, is a ward sister in an old people's hospital. She has no solutions to offer to Northern Ireland's problems. Instead, like her colleagues, she commits herself to easing the burden on those caught up in the troubles by any means possible. She is a Catholic. Rip Van Winkle, that's what we call him, he sleeps forever. Enjoys it. I think um, we're, we're all shades of, of, of opinion, unionists, nationalists, whatever, uh, and we, we have different beliefs and values, we have different identities. That's very important because that's all part of the problem, which will have to be part of the answer, making room for people to grow and develop. Another key member of the group is an Englishman who became embroiled in loyalist politics, Peter Simpson. Well, I was in the Navy, and I got to another place while I was here stationed. And when it came time to leave the Navy, I needed somewhere to live. And I liked this place, so I stayed. I am a right-wing unionist. It's possible for me to be a right-wing unionist and still do the work that I do. I mean, I, I don't have a problem working with a Republican. I mean, I know exactly what Republicans are all about. And uh, I don't think any one of Republican sympathy in there would, would uh, have any difficulty working with me. Group member Jimmy Duffy is a Republican, born and bred in the city. Until he joined the group, he believed the IRA campaign was necessary. At the time, yes, because I believed in it at that time, that yes, it must happen, that the British must go, otherwise we're not going to And being an Irish person, obviously everyone's Irish wants to know Ireland. I thought, how are we going to talk to someone, would you please leave, and they wouldn't have left. So the only way I thought, if that's the way it has to be, it has to be. Jimmy Duffy's family has been at the sharp end of the troubles. A brother shot dead. A son, Liam, still imprisoned after 14 years in Long Cash for his alleged part in a bombing incident. I don't think any person at 16 and a half years of age uh, doing what he's supposed to have done. Uh, as I say, if he was 7 to 28 years, he'd have been out this year. In 28 years, if that happened in the mainland, if anyone committing brutal murder and got 28 years, they'd have been out cry. Duffy says he has never asked his son whether he was involved in the bombing. But it's Liam's imprisonment which brought him to the group. When I went into the Peace and Reconciliation Group in 1979, I uh, saw young people coming into the office for help. 
on a watch, the kind of help that the officer was giving them, and I couldn't believe it. it was fantastic. So, in my opinion, if I can do anything now to s keep young people from getting into bother or doing things wrong, I will bend over backwards till my editors are going to do that. While the city hits the headlines less often than Belfast, the group's work for reconciliation is no less vital here, where the two communities don't even agree on a name. To nationalists who live in Bogside and Cregan, it's Derry. To loyalists whose emotional roots lie in the siege of 1688, it's Londonderry. Despite determined efforts at domestic and industrial normality, this is a city which has suffered. 272 people have been killed since August 1969, when violence erupted in the civil rights marches. The litany of violence includes Bloody Sunday in 1972, when soldiers shot dead 13 Catholics during riots in the Bogside. And a bomb at the Dropping Well Inn outside the city in 1982. A favourite haunt of civilians and off-duty soldiers, 16 died amidst its ruins. The two war-weary communities still express their identity in parades which commemorate the events of a more distant past. Nationalists remember the Easter uprising of 1916. Loyalists celebrate the lifting of the siege of Londonderry in 1689. Political leaders still address each other across a deep divide. It is a sad honour, particularly as I am a replacement speaker for Maria Farrell. And as the world knows, she and her two comrades were executed, and that these assassinations triggered off weeks of unprecedented agony. You can sit at the table with Jerry Adams, but you needn't think that you're going to bring Adams to any table where the Austria elected representatives are going to be sitting alone. The IRA must be taken on in a military fashion. They must be militarily defeated. To the peace and reconciliation group, any speech, any meeting even, can be the trigger to violence. I deplore anyone, no matter who they are, making that type of speech. Because they can go home, and that leaves the, the area in which he's made the speech, and the people who attended the meeting to go home, and perhaps get uh, uh, all worked up and, and cause an incident, which uh, has many ramifications. Away from the headlines, the group's work goes on at grassroots level. Teresa Gallagher frets for her exiled son. The group which first saved his life must now help again. We have lost a son for 14, 15 years. Very, very proud of that son. And I wouldn't like to see any other modern father. Uh, there's any amount of them in this city with young boys and young girls locked away. I mean, if I can help some young person, I would certainly help him. I have a problem with Paul. What's wrong? Well, I know he's been sent away for a year. And he's been, he's been out six months now. Right. I'm kind of worried about him, you know. You I want to see, see maybe if you could see somebody and see if he can be allowed back home again. Well, now I'll go and ask him. But now you know they said a year. So I'll do my best. I mean, you may not like the answer we get, no, but I'll do what I can. Because I'll tell them that uh, you miss him and the usual, and he's behaving himself, and yeah. if he's got another chance, he might come out all right. If they do allow him back, and he starts in and carry on again, I mean, he'll never get another chance. I mean, no I one... I know that. I understand that. Do you understand that? I mean, it's not nice for me to say that to you. I know but that. I mean, that. if you come back to me and I go to them, they say, well, look, uh, Jimmy, we did this before, now he's back again. We're, we're in bother. Theresa Gallagher's request means Jimmy Duffy must reapproach his IRA contact. We talk to anybody. We don't believe in saying, oh, we can't talk to those people. Those are bad people. Or, or, you know, we talk to everyone. Sometimes I don't like the people we talk to, but we'll talk to everyone. I don't apologize for that. We will go to these people to save someone being shot, someone being burned out. We will go and talk to them on both sides. Uh, there's no problem at all, because someone must talk to them. If someone's going to be shot, who do you go to talk to? You don't go to talk to different political groups, because they can't help you. You go to the people who you think may be going to shoot them, or could help them from being shot, that's who you go to. Obviously, it's dangerous. Of course, it's dangerous. Morning, Mitchell. Hello, Jimmy. Uh, How are you doing? I want to put a wee quick word with you, please. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Mitchell. Morning, 
Sinn Féin is the political wing of the IRA. Mitchell McLaughlin is an elected Sinn Féin councillor. He is one of Jimmy Duffy's main channels to the IRA. This uh, young boy up beside us at, uh, six months ago, he was told he had to get out and stay away for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, his mother sent for me yesterday and she says, could I check with someone? Uh, would there be any chance at all of him getting back? Uh, he was told to stay away for a year. He's in England, uh, first time away from home. He's obviously lonely, uh, doesn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And she's well afraid that he get any more bother over there, to be very honest. But she thinks that he's sort of changed. Scared the living daylights out of him, and she thinks if he got back, he may be a change boy. I explained the guy would go and ask, but uh, if he would come back and then he carry on again, well, like, she could never come back to me. If there's a case, right, and if in fact uh, people can, can argue convincingly that he has turned over a new leaf, then, uh, then I think that, that we can do what we can. The lad was involved in uh, quite a lot of antisocial behaviour. I mean, the worry is that if he came back and got involved in that again, that either he or somebody else would get very seriously hurt in all of this. Supposing you'd just gone home to your mum's house and shut the door and stayed there, what would have happened then? Had a good chat. They'd have come to get you? Yeah. Yeah, they would have come and got me and shot me. Plus the fact that yourself, his name, my name, the officer's name. I know Jimmy for many years. I know the people that he works with in the Peace and Reconciliation Group. I know the role that he plays and what he's attempting to achieve. I don't agree with his political analysis. I believe that, uh, that the fundamental difference between Jimmy and myself is that his group uh, has chosen quite consciously to work within the existing situation. I am attempting as part of my political philosophy to bring about some fundamental change in that reality. All you can do is your best. I mean, I know you will. And whatever you tell me, okay. the gospel and I'll explain there. So right. again, bye-bye. Right. Take care of yourself. See you later on. Chill. Chill. We, we've obviously observed them carefully and uh, we've come to the conclusion that they are actually, they tell the truth. They are genuinely interested in helping and uh, in those circumstances, the uh, you know, we, we will certainly cooperate with them as much as possible. What they can't do is come in here on behalf of the British security forces. What they can't do is come in here on, on behalf of individual people who have, uh, say, transgressed the, uh, say, the Republican movement in a particularly serious way. They certainly can, uh, can express their opinion in regard to particular actions of the IRA, but they have to respect that the IRA have a point of view as well. And if we get into the situation of shouting at each other, then the working relationship breaks down. While the IRA considers Paul's case, it is Peter Simpson who deals with the loyalist paramilitaries. He is dismissive of suggestions that such contacts give the men of violence a degree of respectability. Our priority has got to be the life of whoever it is. If in the process we are seen as giving credence to some group, that's a risk we have to accept. Personally, I think it is silly not to talk to people who have power. And uh, these boys have power. Hello, Peter Simpson's main contact is Cecil McKnight, a member of the Ulster Loyalist Democratic Party. He has a detailed knowledge of paramilitary activity. Simpson is anxious about the treatment of a Catholic family on a Protestant estate. Uh, we had one of those calls about intimidation in the, in the waterside area. Well, Peter, I've been touching there with a few people who knew. You know, school yourself. Um, various sources that I have and from what I can gather from them there's no power multi involvement it seems to be sort of individuals I've asked certain people in certain areas and where the attacks have taken place if there was some way that they could sort of go and speak to whoever would know them the question is why loyalist paramilitaries like their nationalist counterparts trust a group which is opposed to the campaigns of violence they've never done us any wrong deeds in the time, maybe at the very beginning, um, we were a bit wary of them, but over the years, like, we learned that we could trust them. Being trusted by all sides, the Peace and Reconciliation Group can use its influence to stop tit for tat killings. Last December, a milkman was murdered on a loyalist estate. Blaming the IRA, loyalists called for revenge. 
the loyalist Parham Aubrey's were put in a position where they had to do something about it. The peace group came and they spoke you know, to the UDA and they said, look, we know fiends are high on the water side at the Tully Alley, but if you came on now on the offensive, there's going to be killings on both sides. And they says that they would go to the Republican side and they would try and find out who actually did the bombing. They came back and they says that the provisional IRA deny all responsibility, that they didn't carry out the attack on Tully Alley, and that that was not their policy, and that the Loyalist people had nothing to fear, and they gave us reassurances. A lot of people were happy. Although the group opposes violence, not least it argues for the practical reason that it achieves nothing, it never publicly condemns atrocities. You don't stop kneecapping by condemning it. You stop it by negotiation, if you can. If you know who to go and negotiate with, if they will listen to you, if they trust you sufficiently. Once they realize that you do not pose a threat, that you don't go about giving information to the security forces, that everything you deal with is dealt with in complete confidentiality. And in fact, the strictest confidence applies in our group. Once people realize that, that you're no danger, you're no threat, they are more likely to at least give you one hearing. You hear it all the time in the media and the newspapers and all this. If you talk to so-and-so, then you approve of so-and-so. That isn't so. Uh, if, we're to, uh, if the road of reconciliation, the journey of reconciliation is to be travelled at all, the first step is dialogue. And certainly, uh, each person on the road has to be told I, uh, that this group does not agree with violence. Uh, at the end of the day, our bottom line is to try and reduce tension and hopefully maybe uh, even save lives at some point. And therefore, at the end of the day, we have to go and talk to people who have some influence on that type of situation. And that's it. Apart from its willingness to negotiate with paramilitaries, there is one other startling fact about the Peace and Reconciliation Group which makes it unique. We have people in this group who once were paramilitaries, who once felt uh, at one with, with the various war efforts. I think it's of vital importance that when people change their minds, that they find a place where they can continue to help their own people and continue to believe in what they believe in. At the same time, do something practical and achieve something positive. If I told you who the ex paramilitaries in our group was, uh, you've got madmen on both sides, psychopaths. And they would just love to take any of the ex paramilitaries in our group. They would love to blow their head off. They say they've shot someone else. I mean, that's what it is. Plus the fact that the ex paramilitaries in our group are doing a great job because they know what's happened. They've been on the ground themselves. And that's what we work. We don't work our way up high. We work with people on the ground. And they know what's happening on the ground. And they've got the, the streetways, for the want of a better word. They are definitely streetways. The trust the group has built up with its paramilitary contacts is fragile. Misunderstandings have come close to shattering that trust with near fatal results. They were burning a car one night and I was coming home at exactly 20 minutes to 10. And a lot of youngsters were sitting on the wee wall and they were watching this car burning. I go around to go to my home and there's four gunmen lying in the garden. Obviously they're waiting for security forces. I mean, I knew that myself. And I said, I mean, there's only going to be shot at these children. I said, if I give you my word that the security forces will not come in, would you please go away? I mean, I was taking my neck out a mile out. And they said, OK, a lot of arguing and bad words as used and everything. But they said, yes, they would go away. A lot of arguing. I got up home, phones on, and I said, look, please keep out of the area. Don't come on the area. There's a car burn, but please keep out. There's children about. Within 30 seconds, I hear sirens flying. Two landowners come on, and there are two wheels flying in the corner. And there they were. Obviously, they didn't hear what I said. They were in looking for these people who was lying there. And I sweated blood for two weeks. I know this had me up. And every time my doorbell rang or somebody knocked the door, I thought they would come for me. And I went to them and I said, look, I was told they will go away. And I said, I didn't do this. Good effort! It isn't all so dramatic. The group also promotes mixed sport. Well, to get a Catholic team to play a Protestant team is near, nigh near impossible over here. On the mainland, you could do that every day of the week, but over here is different. But to get a mixed team, the manager of that team works very hard at it. He deserves the credit. You see this match today? I don't want any ego. It's not Celtic versus Rangers. It's just a match. Do you hear? You ready? <laughs> 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 
fear. That's the wee word, fear. No, no, it was fear. And you can't blame them in this situation, you know. But until they get over that fear, we're going to have this. But the young boys behind me, as you see, and they've got plenty of supporters of them, and their parents are up. So they've got over the fear. It can work, and it does work. Well, my idea is, if you're playing sport together, and you're playing together, it's very, very, very hard if they meet you later on, maybe have each other's on the side of a rifle. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but just maybe that they might have. I think they'll find it very difficult to pull the trigger because they've played here today or played somewhere else against each other. Each year, the group organises a holiday in Cork for Protestant and Catholic families. On holiday, the sectarian divisions disappear, friendships are formed. Back home, the old suspicions reassert themselves. New friends across the divide don't get visited. I don't think, Jean, I think about Cromley Craig. No, I would, feel very, I would feel uneasy. Yeah. Just like a, a nervous kind of person, or just a feel like they should be safe. My children, which are Catholic, they always help to look after them, play with them, and there's no question anything. You know. our, our children are a mix of the children at school, mm. the children of the states, so that's as far as they be, you know. It's just don't they don't else. know each other, you know, they never come in contact with each other. The peace and reconciliation group survives because it is prepared to talk to everybody and is seen to be totally even-handed. If it deals with the paramilitaries, it must also talk to the army and to the police. Any policeman or any soldier in Northern Ireland who uh, does not respect the rights of the individuals here, not only is it against the law, but it's also ethically wrong. It is also uh, totally counterproductive. We appreciate you have the most difficult job to do in Northern Ireland, but you've got to do it right. You have to buy the respect that's required to, to keep the support for our law. Members of the group make regular visits to the security forces. Here too they are trusted, even when they bring complaints. The one that's worrying me very, very much is the, uh, the soldiers are now stabbing the young people in different areas, in the nationalist areas. Uh, a very, very wet day, oh, just over a week ago, they made the young boys take off their jackets, stand on them on the ground in the wet, and taking off their shoes and socks. I mean, this is not on. And what the young boys are, they're refusing to say no, because if they do, they're going to be arrested and held for maybe four hours. They're afraid, yeah. And they're afraid. I mean, that, that can't go on because what's going to happen, they're going to turn all the young people completely against them and then we're going to have problems. In and around the city, 76 soldiers and 22 members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary have been murdered during the Troubles, shot or blown up. Hello, Hello, Nice to see you. Yeah. Hello, Christmas, lady. Nice to see you again. Yeah. A lovely okay. weekend. The weather was glorious. Meetings between the group and the security forces are confidential. We were not allowed to film. But the area's former RUC divisional commander, Bert McCaffrey, did outline the advantages he found working with the group containing ex paramilitaries. As long as they're former paramilitaries, you see, I would have no difficulty with that at all. Uh, and I know that uh, former paramilitaries and the original members of the group and the present uh, new recruits to the group, I'm quite happy that all of those people do not support violence. I mean, I, I'm willing to accept support from them if that's their view. In many respects, we wanted them to uh, take a message to the community, and we were only too willing to learn from them the sensitivities in the community and where we might uh, seek to do things in, a, in a, a more sensitive way. This was a very, very successful indeed because in, in a sense they were able to mirror the, the feelings of the community and in a way they, they acted from time to time as our conscience in a sense because uh, I can remember uh, frequently uh, uh, hot words being exchanged where we proposed to take a particular course of action and Margaret or some of her representatives would say, now look here, you'd have to think again about that because you, you don't realise what's going to happen if you do that. The nationalist paramilitary campaigns increasingly target members of the security forces. In the face of these attacks, the paramilitary's so-called war effort, the group admits it is powerless. 
right, we can't do a thing about that. And in, in such a situation, we're no use anyway. We're limited to what we can achieve. Uh, we work with uh, possibilities all the time. But it's most of the time something that is at least attainable, something that is practical. There's no point in waving a big flag and saying, uh, we must have peace because it just doesn't mean a damn thing. But you say that you won't interfere in the war effort of the paramilitaries. What do you mean by that? Um, well, it's not our job to get in their way. I mean, let them get on with it. That's, that's what they're there for. I mean, getting on with it means they're killing people, which you're opposed to. Yes, I'm opposed to people being taken out and shot. But I'm also opposed to people sticking their oars in where they're not wanted. I don't think that if you got in the way of such, uh, such things actively, that you would achieve very much anyway, except perhaps collecting your own head. The killings continue. The fear and suspicion between the two sides lingers. After 12 years existing on a financial shoestring of grants and donations, group members must sometimes be tempted to give up. If I got up and walked out of the door and said, right, bog here, that would be letting my friends down. And I wouldn't want to do that. But many a time I felt like doing it. I'm sure there's many a time they felt like doing it. Perhaps for a millisecond when you, when you look at the news and you see somebody has been killed in some particularly ghastly way, yes, maybe for a millisecond, but then, uh, I mean, what's, what's the use of us all lying down? Despite its unique achievement in winning and holding the trust of everybody from the security forces to the paramilitaries, does even the Peace and Reconciliation Group make any impact on the situation? I don't think we can change the situation, really. The only people who can do that are the protagonists, the people who are actually fighting. Uh, we are in existence in order to help the people who suffer as the result of, uh, of what's going on. And to that extent, we do some good. Every time somebody goes out of this door having been helped, then we've done some good. Despite frustrations and setbacks, the group does receive occasional encouragement. In recent days, Jimmy Duffy has received news about his son Liam, imprisoned in Long Cash for 14 years. Well, we just got word yesterday that they will be out by Christmas, which is absolutely fantastic, after 14 years. So does that mean he'll be working with you in the office? Hey, well, yes, he said he would help us out in the office. I mean, helping us in the office is helping us, but actually be helping the people outside our office. We don't need the help in the office, we want to help the people outside the office. And he worked very closely with us. So he shares your views now? It certainly does, yes. And to help other people outside, he's streetways, he's been on for 14 years, so he knows, he's got contacts, same as we have. So all it can be is a benefit to the office and we'll be helping people outside the office on the ground. And there's been good news for Teresa Gallagher. The Peace and Reconciliation Group has arranged for her to travel to Liverpool to be reunited with her son Paul. It's their first meeting for ten months. <laughs> you look well. yeah. Paul now has a job. But he is anxious to return to Northern Ireland for a holiday. Jimmy Duffy, who knows criticising the IRA's treatment of Paul is pointless, now believes his negotiations on Paul's behalf will be successful. I mean, I will talk to him and ask him, and he will let him go back for a holiday because he's going to meet his mum, and it'll be great. But they'll be watching him like a hawk. If he comes back, obviously, and steps out of line, they'll blow his head off. It's just as simple as that. Then they'll come back to me and say, you have to come back for a holiday, and look what they done. The thing that makes reconciliation work even if it's very, very slow, is action. Condemnation of violence, that happens all the time. I mean, we, the prime ministers, uh, people in political parties and in the churches and influence groups all over the place consistently. And it's, of course, it's, it's, it's right that, that they, should, they should say that this is totally wrong. No human being should be dying in the streets of Northern Ireland, no matter who or he or she is. But to make reconciliation work, it has to go a lot further than that. The action uh, comes harder. Reconciliation is to defend each other's right to be different and uh, try and inform each other what each other is about.